We're on the last legs of our, uh, our session here, and we have one presentation le left to make uh, by Dr. Bastian Morishtad, uh, who's the head of uh, Radio Analytical Laboratories um, at what's now called the Karls Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Uh, that particular uh, research facility has been there a long time. I, in my days, it was called KFK. And uh, they still do an awful lot of work. They're requiring the, uh, uh, the techniques and uh, skills that uh, Bastian manages in his uh, radio analytical facility. Uh, but the real, I think the real reason that, uh, that Bastian's here is, is that he, uh, in 2011, he came uh, to the USTUR to do a sabbatical, and uh, he worked very much on uh, modeling chelation therapy during a six-month uh, during a six-month sabbatical. So, uh, without taking more of his time, I'm going to invite Boston to talk about modeling aberration biokinetics after intensive decorporation therapy. Okay, thank you, Ray. Um, I'm going to start my presentation with the questions: Why do we want to use USTUR data for the modeling? And we know about DTPA chelation that it removes the accessible americium in the extracellular fluids. Um, so we need to know how these are represented in these ICRP models. And I'd like to have an example to show this. I take the case 269 data, uh, with, with, uh, which was a chelated case. And um, you see the urinary data together with two models. One, the light blue line, shows the model prediction for non-chelated. And the um, dark blue line shows a model prediction for a chelation which takes only place in one compartment, which is the ST0, the soft tissues, which are meant to represent the extracellular fluids. We heard, already heard today that chelation effectively uh, removes liver content. So why couldn't we assume that some of the chelation takes place in liver? And now I show some models which add a chelation in the liver compartment to some percentage, and you see that all of the models are uh, able to provide a good fit to the urinary data. So the question is, uh, which model do you want to choose? And if you look at the prediction of the models for, for example, the uh, total body content, you see that they are strongly differing. You have the lower line, which is the lung, which is not affected, and you have the unchelated model, and somewhere in between all of these models end. And we w want to select the model, and that's where USTUR comes into play, because they provide data uh, points. They have this health physics database about all this urinary and fecal excretion, some are in vivo counting, so that's this type of data. And they provide the um, autopsy data, which is the points at the end of the scale. And this is what guides us in selecting of the model. That's why we are interested in using the US2R data. So the case, 846, it was a worker who manufactured sources containing americium oxide, and he manufactured 50 of these sources uh, in a time span of three years. And um, one of the tasks was compacting and pressing of one of the pellets in a pressing hood. He wore a half mask respirator for transfer and compacting this. And now this is a quote, a small amount of visible dust was sometimes released during the pressing operation in the hood. So being a health physicist, I would say this is a good reason to investigate. Unfortunately, they didn't. Um, so when uh, low levels of alpha and beta gamma activity were detected in urine samples, uh, an inspector of the Atomic Energy Com Commission sent uh, the worker to a whole body counter and you found 1.8 millicuries or 66 kilobacterials of americium body burden, which is 60, uh, 36 times the maximum permissible burden at that time. So there was a good uh, deal to investigate this. Um, the worker was removed from work and the chelation therapy was started. It was a long therapy, 380 weeks, like seven years. In total, there was more than 300 grams of DTPA. Most of the dosage was one gram DTPA per week. There was a period where they did twice a week a half gram DTPA and there were some weeks without treatment. And what makes the case special is you have a huge uh, data set. You have weekly body counts until the 60 week of therapy, your fecal collection until week 80, and virtually all urine has been collected under therapy. So it's a very collaborative uh, patient. You have a daily collection in the first two years of therapy, then they switch to weekly collection intervals in the following five years, 
and only in the last year they collected only one week per month. So it's a very extensive data set. The case has been studied intensively in the 1960s and 70s when it happens. There has been a research grant on this. There were several reports and papers in Health Physics Journal. The last publication about this case was a chapter in the book for the HPS Summer School in 2004. And I know at least one of the original investigators is here in this room. Um, we have all the biosay data, exposure, and medical records are available at the USTUR. So the picture shows how my desk looked during the sabbatical. That's all the data, and you see it's all handwritten and hand-drawn graphs. And so I looked at the data and uh, digitized them and made an Excel file that contained all the data. I had to normalize the data, and that's now the data set available for the modeling. Um, I just want to say some words about the original analysis they had. We have to keep in mind it was a pre-ICRP publication 30 era. So we didn't have any compartmental models. It was just the empirical equations, like the Lehmann equations, that were uh, used for the assessment of the case. And the assumption was an average intake two years before the therapy. It is assumed to be kind of chronic intake over the whole period of three years, but for the modeling they also used this two years before therapy uh, average intake. And the assumption was that DTPA complexes americium and plutonium as soon as it leaves bone surfaces and transports the complex to urine for excretion. The conclusions I cite from this uh, summer school paper is half of the body burden removed is by the action of DTPA. So this was a very successful therapy. And seven years post-therapy, the body burden was uh, 0.7 millicuries with most of the remaining burden in bones. So that's the conclusion they had. Now for the new analysis, I used the ICRP compartmental models and the reference values. So that I used the Lung model of ICRP publication 66. The reference class assigned is type M material. I take the ICRP 67 systemic model for enrichment biokinetics, and I take the simpler ICRP 30 GI uh, tract model with the reference F1 value of uh, 5 to the minus, three, uh, minus 4. First step in modeling is to define the initial scenario using the pre-therapeutic data and information. So this could be another talk because it takes lots of time and is a very complicated issue. I have two points for before the therapy. That's one urine data and one whole body data. And uh, trying to fit them both at the same time with this type M is possible. And I end up with an acute intake of 1.2 megabacterials of emerytium 380 days before the therapy. So it's not two years, but one year, but it makes uh, me able to fit the data. Then I apply the Conrad model of DTPA therapy. That's, uh, you see, this is the box and arrow representation you find for the compartmental models. And we have three systems seen there. So one is describing the emerytium biokinetics. That's the ICRP67 model, including the lung model, which I collapse into only one box here. Then we have one part of the model that describes the injected forms of the DTPA. And the third part of the model that describes the complexes of emerytium with the DTPA, which are rapidly excreted. And we model the chelation by coupling the compartments whenever they are assumed to be in the same space and DTPA, like in this part of the model, and the uh, partner compartment in the systemic model. Uh, we have filled, then we have a second order movement to this new system, and we have a uh, parameter, we call it chelation constant, KC, that describes the, the rate, how fast this goes, and it's very quickly. Big issue about this modeling is we go into using moles instead of uh, backwards because we have this uh, stoichiometry behind in the chemistry and we have different orders of magnitude. Here we are in the, uh, in the picomoles range and here we are in the millimoles range. So the numerics gets a bit difficult. In the original Conrad model, which we developed during an European project, we assumed that the chelation only takes place in this ST0 compartment, which is uh, assumed to be the extracellular fluids. When the Conrad uh, project finished, we uh, continued working in this Eurodos Working Group 7. Maria already reported about some of the work. And now we reformulated the model so that the chelation is also possible in other compartments, like in the liver compartments. Um, so I just show some data. This is the daily urinary excretion data we have. And you see the data points, and you see the model uh, without chelation which hits the first data point, that's how it's designed. 
And um, what you can observe is the effect of DTPA at the day after injection. That's like this line for the one gram of DTPA per week or for the two times a half a gram per week. And you see it goes down to a baseline, which is elevated compared to the um, unchelated model and is a bit steeper in between. Um, now, we can see the enhancement factor between the two lines is roughly five. And um, if I now make a model which allows 25% of the chelation to take place in liver and the chelation constant of one to the minus 10, I am able to describe the data more or less uh, good, so I can describe the enhancement, but the model I have goes down to a baseline which is below the unchelated baseline. Um, this is how we model with the second order kinetics, and then we have to um, investigate a bit more about this um, uh, micro modeling of the single chelations. Um, and it also might be the case that the DTPA in action is taking longer. So we don't go to the baseline with the data because the next injection came too fast before the effect of DTPA vanished. So this is, might be another explanation. I show this model because it also fits the whole body retention data at the same time. So this is a model that describes the whole body retention and the urinary excretion. And now let's look at the um, predictions of the model in the retention in liver, skeleton, and lungs. And so you see the fit of the whole body data and if you look at the liver, you see it steeply goes down. That's what we expect because we have the chelation taking place in liver and you see the autopsy data, which in uh, uh, data from USTUR and we are in the right direction. And you also see when the therapy stopped, the liver starts to get refilled again. So that's models uh, doing what we expect here. For the skeleton, we don't expect any big effect because we don't take, uh, have chelation uh, happening there. It's just the uh, blood that's uh, not delivering anymore. And we see it's more or less constant and it's pointing in the right direction. So it's uh, rather fine. We get into trouble when we look at the lungs because assuming type M material or former times was the Weeks, uh, Weeks uh, class, we know that it, after a thousand days, the lungs are more or less empty. Uh, and if you look at the data, you see that there's a still a significant amount left in the lungs. So apparently, acute inhalation of type M material is not a good, chase and, uh, good choice in this case. So the reference assumption is not a good choice here. You could argue, okay, then let's go to type S material. So I just switched the parameters to make a type S curve, which looks better now but you don't describe whole body retention or urinary excretion anymore. And it's not possible to find any model, either acute or chronic with M type or S type, that's able to fit all the data available. That's the big issue. So the initial scenario we need to know uh, needs to be refined. The problem is there's uh, not much information. You know, it's a three years time. There's sometimes a small amount of visible dust. Could be several acute intakes, could be a chronic intake. So there's a bit uh, of things to be discussed in this case. So let me sum up. I hope you all agree that the USTUR is a unique resource for the biokinetic modeling. Looking at the case, we have this extensive data set, but the intake scenario is undefined. So we need many assumptions for the modeling and you need to justify your assumptions. You couldn't just say it fits the data, so it's a nice assumption, but you need to at least have a physiological link why you assume uh, this, uh, or why you take this assumption. Uh, a nice side effect of the USTR case is it contributed to the education of students at KIT. So Sergey was a nice, also kind uh, to ship some of the uh, uh, lung samples when they sliced the lung, informally and fixed to KIT. And what we did, we put them into uh, our gamma lab with the germanium detectors, and we had students who did the measurements and uh, who did the Monte Carlo modeling to take into account all the weight and different shapes of this. So there were at least three students involved in this work, and I think they learned a lot about MCNP and uh, gamma spectrometry. So it was a nice side effect of this case. Um, so I have to thank Sergey for being so kind and supporting this action. I have to thank all of the us to our people to being uh, great hosts to me and I really enjoyed the stay there. And um, when you look at this five decade follow up of plutonium and uranium workers, I wish that there will be some more decades to come to this work. So thank you for your attention.
Any questions or comments? Yeah. Um, I, I first got confused when you said that uh, in spite of your scenario that you described, you assumed acute intake two years prior to, to, uh, uh, to chelation. Uh, seems like uh, a, it sounded more like a chronic a type intake. And uh, it, I, have, I have worked at a, a Mauricium case where there was a there was an acute intake, and it was about a year before chelation, and I showed that uh, the amount removed from chelation, he was chelated three times, was very very small percent because it had already been incorporated to the bone and was not in the liver, and uh, but it looks like your data indicates that it's probably uh, still in the liver, and why you've got 50% removal from chelation or something, uh, and uh, uh, so perhaps there was intakes s sooner to the to the point of chelation that allowed that. Well, actually, what we know from this case that there's um, the three years period of work where the intake could have happened, and we know that there's a delay between I think it's 120 days delay between the begin of therapy, and so that's the only borders I have for placing the intake. And what I did, I took, uh, I solved all the models for the different uh, assumptions like type M acute over a given time at the beginning, over a given time at the end of the scenario, over the whole time with a constant rate, uh, acute at the beginning, at the middle point, at the end point. And I took the ratios of urine, feces, whole body. Uh, the point is you never reach a good agreement. So for example, if you uh, are able to fit the urinary data with one scenario, you don't fit the whole body data, yeah. and vice versa. So I wasn't able to define uh, an initial scenario. The only thing that worked out was this acute intake, which I think isn't the case. To me, it feels more like there's a kind of low-level chronic intakes with some acute events in between, yeah. but this is hard to reconstruct. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It, it, I was just surprised at first when you got so much uh, removed from the chelation that it uh, didn't seem to fit an acute intake two years prior. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ron? Yes. I have to bring this down to the normal height here. It's not doing very well, so I'll just hold it if you don't mind. Interesting. Very interesting, and I have about 212 questions, but okay. I'm, only, time. I'm only going to ask two, or I'm going to comment. Some years ago, the uh, registries published a paper on lung clearance, yes. and I think that may explain, or it wasn't the greatest data, it was all that we had, but it may explain why you see that difference and what we saw was uh, a log normal distribution, et cetera. So I know it's from the ERPA conference. Pardon me? Do you refer to the paper from the ERPA conference in 2008? No, I refer no? to the okay. paper from, what's that? Uh, the one on, uh, yeah, yeah, lung and lymph nodes. It, 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 I alluded to it in, in, in my okay. yeah. earlier paper, it showed, yeah. as I, I think I used the words non, not unexpectedly, that the clearance was impaired in smokers, yeah. et cetera. And what I have found is that the, with all due respect to the ICRP, that that uh, lung model really is not realistic. Well, but you might want to take a sneak a peek at that because it shows the clearance and where things stay. The other... Uh, question I have is, years ago, a, not too many years ago, but a, a model was proposed for americium clearance by the USTUR. Did you by any chance happen to look at that and see if it fits your data at all? Uh, no, actually, for, I didn't do this, but I'm, I'm just in the first steps of, uh, well, still in the first steps because they keep me busy with the lab. Well, um, what are you waiting for? Get back to your lab and get busy. <laughs> Actually, but another thing about the lung clearance is there's still the option of having a bound state. 
Ah, yeah. And this is you, you can take many assumptions, but the, the point I want to make is you need to justify why you assume and to have a link between the physiology that you want to model. And that's, you can have lots of models that are able to deliver a good fit, but you need to justify why you made this assumption, because the predictions of the models will vary very strongly. I could not agree with you more on that. And I hope you keep up this good work. And the other 200 questions, uh, 210 questions. Uh, you see, there's an email address. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to grab you outside. Uh, but I'll be here as well. <laughs> Bastian, I'd like to encourage you to, uh, to open up the model and, and try some values for the bound state. I mean, the bound state was created based on animal data, but, yeah. but it's, it's a real physiological phenomenon. Yes. And uh, I, think, I think that there are ample reasons to expect that there would be a certain fraction yes. that uh, is going to stay around for a very long time. Yeah, yeah there's lots of things to play with. No more questions? Okay. Um, I think this uh, 